Version 4.2 left me speechless, my jaw literally fell to the ground. Manset and Liyue were good, Inazuma was great, Sumeru was incredible, but Fontaine was basically perfection. And at this point, I can even imagine how Natlen and Snezhnaya are going to be. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. We need to have a long talk about Fontaine 4.2. As always, this is a theory video. I use information available in the game, but my theories and conclusions are not to be considered the official lore of the game, unless I get something right and it's confirmed in a little update of the game itself. In this video, we will talk about everything that happened in the Archon Quest, with also a mention to Farina's character story, so if you haven't played them yet and you don't like spoilers, maybe you should come back later. As for the Narcissan Koitz quest and everything else in 4.2, you will have to wait for my next video. With that being said, let's start with a very short and concise recap of the Archon Quest. Also, since it's clear enough that the game doesn't even know how to pronounce the word Oceanids, Oceanids? I will simply call them Oceanids as I used to in the beginning, which is also easier for me. Because the water suddenly rose, Poisson was destroyed and some people were dissolved. Arlecchino then directed us to some ancient ruins where Navia almost got dissolved as well. In these ruins, we found 3 out of 4 slates depicting the prophecy and, because Egeria is also shown to have been punished by the heavenly principles, Nevelet decides to pressure Farina into spilling the beans, but he failed. That's when, with a group effort and some acting, we forced Farina into the Opera IP class for her own trial. The goal of the trial was to prove that Farina wasn't the Hydro Archon, and when the truth finally came out, the Oratrice sentenced the Hydro Archon to death. Ramene then brought the first missing slate that showed that the original sin was Egeria's decision to turn her oceanids into humans with the power of the Primordial Sea without Celestial's approval. Nevelet then realized that the rise of the Primordial Sea was a different problem caused by the huge narwhal that grew too much inside the Primordial Sea itself. The narwhal appears in the Opera IP class for a quick Primordial snack, but Child sends it back by enough time. The Oratrice prepared itself to deliver the death sentence and the Traveler ended up watching Furina's story in her inner world, when the Velet met Fossilor, who explained her plan to deceive and shake the heavenly principles using Indemnidium to annihilate both herself and her divine throne, so that the Velet could regain his full dragonhood and his control over the Primordial Sea to judge the Fontanians, turning them into real humans and preventing them from dissolving anymore. After that, we fought and defeated the Narwhal to get back the Primordial Sea it consumed. Skirk appears, she explained a few things, we go back to a flooded fontaine and to the most incredible cutscene this game has ever shown us, but everybody is now okay and Fontaine is finally safe. Now, let's go back and analyze some key moments of the Archon Quest. Falling into Primordial Water doesn't mean being instantly dissolved. Just like Navia, people are tried in an oceanid courtroom to decide whether they're guilty, which means they're part of the collective, or innocent, that is, being independent beings that deserve to live as humans. This is actually what I thought the third slate meant. I believe that Farina was going to be tried in the oceanid courtroom and she would have been pronounced innocent, so not one of them, because she wasn't able to save them, which would have caused the fourth slate, her being the only person alive in Fontaine. Talking about the slates, the first one shows Egeria turning the oceanids into humans, and I don't know about you, but the way they drew that looks the other way around, but that's beside the point. The second slate shows Egeria and her oceanid people kneeling before Celestia, repenting for their sins, but also Celestia's disapproval and sentence. The third slate again is Farina being tried, and the fourth is Farina weeping alone on her throne when the prophecy had been fulfilled. Now, the biggest question here is who came up with the prophecy and drew those slates? Originally, I thought that it had been Nabu Malikata, since there was a connection between her and Egeria, but things are very different now. To try and answer this question, we need to understand when Egeria turned the Oceanids into humans. I have two main hypotheses and I can justify both of them, although the first one is the one I believe the most. Nevelet was able to extract the true meaning of the prophecy with his powers and he said, The Hydro Archon as one of the seven did not possess the authority to create a new form of human life. 
This means that Egeria committed her sin after she became the Hydro Archon, so after Remuria's fall, 2000 years ago, give or take a century or two. Then we also have Celestia sentencing Egeria above Fontaine, its current location. And we know that it used to hover above Dragonspine back when the ancient civilization of Salvendagnir was thriving in what I call the Envoy Age. Lastly, we have the method Egeria chose to turn the Oceanids into humans. This sounds a lot like what Remus did when he received from Egeria the goblet with promoted water, what he calls Ihor which he then decided to put into the immortal stone, the Lithos, to create his golems. This almost sounds like Egeria was inspired by Remus's experiment and tried to do the same. Now going back to Remuria's fall, in my 4.1 analysis video I thought that Barbeloth was the seer that Remus found, the golden bee since Barbeloth's codename is, indeed, bee, but Mona simply destroyed that theory by saying that she was only a few centuries old. Nevertheless, Mona also gave us a huge hint. To be able to see the fate of a nation or of the whole world, you would need so much power that you wouldn't be an astrologist anymore, but a visionary, a term that we encountered almost at the end of the Archon Quest. Skirk mentioned a few individuals who are greater than humanity itself, among which she mentioned Vedderfolnir, the visionary. Now, Vederfelner in Norse mythology is the hawk sitting between the eyes of an unnamed eagle perched on the word tree Yggdrasil. This hawk is considered to be a divine observer that relays information, a bird that can travel and see across multiple domains because, as most birds in Norse mythology, it is unshackled from physical boundaries. Now, Mona, again, said something extremely sus about Nicole. If she were still alive... Which by itself, this statement makes no sense because we just told her that we literally had a conversation with Nicole. During that conversation though, Nicole did say... The voice from the sky, hmm? I fear that description is wrong. Though, not completely wrong. She never showed herself. She can sense Ermosul changes, and Ermosul is the world tree. And according to Mona, she is way older than Barbeloth Trismegistus, which, by the way, is the name that the Greek god Hermes, the herald of the gods, received when he was combined with the Egyptian god of wisdom Thoth, becoming Hermes or Trismegistos. Okay, okay, I'll say it. Nicole is most likely Vedderfölnir, and she is somehow dead but alive. But I'm not gonna try and explain that because I'll lose my mind. But I want to say something that is most likely going to be completely wrong. Vedderfölnir being a hawk with no physical boundaries did remind me of Vanessa after she ascended to Celestia thanks to Venti. And just to be clear, Vedderfölnir means wind withered but also because her teacup is the same as those we can find in Diluc's house. I said in my Hexen Circle video that Diluc was saved from the Harbingers in the past by most likely one of the witches, probably one from Natlan considering the design of the teacup. And if you think about it, Vanessa was indeed from Natlan just like Diluc's ancestors, and his surname, Ragan Vinder, is as Norse as Vedderfölnir. Of course, as I said before, this idea may be completely wrong, namely because Vanessa ascended a thousand years ago, while Egeria's sin happened at least two thousand years ago. Anyway, as I said before, there is another option for the chronology of the events depicted in the prophecy. If you read the description of the splendor of tranquil water, you would know that Erinias, a Loch Knight that fought against Remuria to avenge her people and family, was looking for the pure grail to free Egeria from her confinement and to wash away the sin that she was born with. Additionally, two more Loch Knights from her tribe survived Remuria's attack. One became the Garden of the Pure Waters that Remus hadn't seized yet, while the other one joined Remuria and became a Harmus, Cassiodor. Erinias, though, never found the Pure Grail, but after Remuria's fall, Celestia freed Egeria and placed her as a Hydro Archon. This means that, according to this weapon, the Oceanids had already turned into humans before Remus arrived, so the original sin must have originated in a very ancient time. Most likely the Envoy Age, since in Fontaine it ended with a massive rain that flooded the entire nation, leaving just a few survivors to live for millennia as savages. 
As for the chronology, this is when Egeria was confined. Then Remus visited her and she gave him the Goblet of Primordial Water, meaning that the first sovereign named in Echoes of the Deep Tides wasn't the water dragon but Egeria herself. The second option chronologically can make sense, but apart from Nivellet specifically saying that Egeria committed her sin when she was one of the seven, there's just one little detail that would be easier to explain if the sin originated after Remuria's fall. Carl Ingold. Rene kept saying that Carl's body composition was completely different from that of the people of Fontaine, meaning that he was a real human. But we also know that Carl grew up in the Nazisenkoitz Institute, so he was born in Fontaine. If Egeria's sin was committed after Remuria fell, then it would be easy to explain. His ancestors were regular humans from Fontaine, before the Oceanids became Oceanid people. I mean, if the Oceanids never left Fontaine, how would have they witnessed the humans living their lives so much as to envy them? That should mean that Fontaine was inhabited by actual people, the savages that Remus then found and conquered. But again, the splendor of tranquil water does paint a different chronology, so I'm at a loss. What do you think is the right chronology? Let me know in the comments. Now it's time to talk about Farina and Fossilor. We were kinda led to believe them to be two different people and in a sense they could be considered as such since they have two independent minds, but technically it's just one single person. Fossilor is just an aspect of Furina, it's her divinity, so if anything we could say that she has a split personality at best. My focus though is on something else. When did Egeria choose Fossilor as her successor? Well, Fossilor told us that she was, just like the other Oceanids, turned into a human and then she received her divinity. If the sin was committed after Remuria's fall, then Fossilor would be, apparently, at least 2000 years old, but I actually don't think so. Fossilor did make some contrasting statements that make the story slightly more complex to figure out, specifically that Furina is as naive as her past self when she first became a human, which seems to mean that Fossilor lived as a human in the past, but she also says that she yearned to live as a human, something she was never able to do, because as soon as she became a human, she also became a god, the successor of Egeria, and she split her divinity from her body. I think there is only one explanation here. Fossilor was turned by Egeria into a human and soon after into a god 499 years and 241 days ago. You might ask where do these numbers come from? They are the scene or act number in Furina's story. Each scene is a day and 182,376 days are exactly 499 years, 241 days, if every year lasted 365 days, so ignoring leap years. So my theory is that Egeria committed the sin once again right before leaving for Canria, turning Purina into a god to be her successor and when Egeria died, Fossilor split her divinity from her human body, so she was only able to live as a human for a few days at best. Now, since Egeria decided to choose a successor, she somehow knew that she would have died in Canria. She chose Fossilor for her astuteness, believing that she would have been able to finally prevent the prophecy. We learned that Egeria's justice was existence, while Fossilor's justice was its continuation. So Egeria more or less expected Fossilor to devise a detailed plan to deceive the heavenly principles. This plan included both the invitation for Nouvellet to Fontaine, meaning that he wasn't born there by the way, so that he would learn to love and then forgive humanity, but above all, Furina's acting performance. Everything was planned inside Furina's inner world, or mental plane, or simply her consciousness, a place where, like Nicole told us, the god's gaze cannot reach. And let me highlight this concept for you. In Nicole's eyes, the gods are the heavenly principles, not the Archons. Fossilor's plan also involved the creation of the Oratrice, which was meant to acquire the people's belief in justice and turn it into Indemnirium, which is a similar concept to the power of people's dreams inside the Akasha system in Sumeru. 
The Oratrice's real goal was not to judge the people, but to carry out the death sentence against the Hydro Archon thanks to the power it had slowly accumulated in 500 years. A power strong enough to destroy the Divine Seed itself, shaking the order established by the Heavenly Principles as a consequence. Everything had to be done in order to give Nevelet his full dragon authority back. The authorities that the dragons first lost and then were stolen by the heavenly principles. Meaning that, as I said in the past, the Promorial One took the dragon's powers, hence the name Usurper, and then the heavenly principles stole them when they won against the Promorial One. Anyway, Fossilor's goal was for Nevelet to gain back his full control over the Promorial Sea and pronounce the people of Fontaine innocent, turning the Promorial water in their veins into true blood, just like it happened, it seems, at the dawn of Tevat, preventing them from dissolving because of the Promorial water ever again. With Fossilor, we should now start to consider something really important. The Archons are slowly turning against the Heavenly Principles. It was clear from the manga that Venti felt some kind of disgust when he thought about them. John Lee voluntarily gave his gnosis to the Tsaritsa because of some secret agreement they had, and the Tsaritsa isn't making it a secret that she's going against the Heavenly Principles. Makoto told A that when Eternary and Dreams shine in unison, the Sacred Sakura Tree would blossom finally free from the clutches of the Heavenly Principles. Fossilor's life goal was to shake the order established by the Heavenly Principles, destroying her Divine Seed. While Nahida is mostly neutral, although she decided to give her Gnosis to Dottore in exchange for information about the truth of Tvat, so she made that decision after learning who the Heavenly Principles really are. As for the reason why the current Seven and some of their predecessors, excluding Nigeria, changed their minds about them, I think it's related to whatever happened in Kanria, but we still know too little to figure it out. Our only hope is Dainsleff's new quest we will play somewhere around version 4.5. When it comes to Purina, on the other hand, do you remember that in my 4.1 analysis video I said that stating the obvious over and over again that she is the Hydro Archon of Fontaine, Fossilor, the God of Justice, meant that there was a problem with that and that it really wasn't true? Well, Furina indeed was a human all along. Furthermore, in my old Fontaine video I tried to figure out her kid through the Hydro enemy's attacks. So this is what I said. Her elemental skill may involve something that can heal or attack based on the necessity, like Sayu's Yuhu art, Mujina Flurry, which means that I correctly predicted her elemental skill. I also said for the burst, I'm almost completely sure it will involve bubbles, so it seems that I also correctly predicted her using bubbles in her burst attack, although she actually uses them in her elemental skill and normal attack too. Considering the Gentilhomme Asher, Serentendante Cheval Marin, and Mademoiselle Crabaletta fight using bubbles, and Furina's last normal attack happens with her sitting on a bubble. As for her story, she was basically a victim and a hero. She was forced to play a role that was completely different from her true self. She was granted a normal life and right after she lost that privilege. She had to live beyond her normal lifespan, probably risking suffering from erosion as well. She had to deceive everyone for 500 years, watching her fellow humans live their whole natural lives like she was supposed to, while carrying this burden alone because of the constant fear of being discovered, never letting go for not even a split second, never allowed to simply give up. And her act ended with her being deceived as well, being forced, once again, to apparently fail her mission. It's no wonder she completely shut down when the truth came out. After the trial ended, she also found out that she was even deceived by Fossilor, since she didn't tell her what the true goal of the plan was, so her trust was completely shattered from every front. Furina has, so far, the best written story in the entire game, at least according to me. Though, now that the act is over, she lost her characteristic exuberance that made her unique. Which is kinda sad since she sounds like a deflated balloon now. But then again, her fake exuberance was her people's fault. They praised the gentle Egeria, but they were dissatisfied right from the start by the equally gentle Furina. 
since no one except for Nevelet and Risley even named Egeria in free whole updates, were the people secretly dissatisfied with her too? Also, why did the Oceanids that fled from Ten believe that Farina was sending assassins after them? And why did Idea say that the water of Fontaine became filled with hatred? Farina wasn't even a god so she couldn't have changed the feelings of the water, and neither Farina nor Fossilor really cared about those Oceanids since they were slightly too preoccupied with the prophecy. I hope that this will be explained in Animula Koraji Chapter 2. Talking about something unexplainable, I did find an inconsistency to share with you, but treat this as nothing serious really. The Oceanid people pray to the Fountain of Lucene for a child, unaware that this was a necessary ritual for the Oceanids in the spring water to be blessed and be born after some months. Now, I would imagine that Egeria planned the Oceanid women to give birth like normal humans, otherwise they would have figured out that something was off. The problem is, what about the relationships between a Fontanian and a foreigner? Well, if it's a Fontanian woman and a foreigner man like Vignere and Vache, it's easy. They will go to the fountain to pray and she will end up being pregnant. There's no DNA test, so the man will never know that it's not really his child. But what if it's the other way around? Or what if the Fontanian was living abroad and never came back to Fontaine? Out of logic, these people would have never had children, because I suppose it would be impossible to have a children from an oceanid and a human. Did no one ever notice anything? Once again, don't take this too seriously. It is strange, but it's not really important. This was just a short, light intermission before our next really heavy topic. Our next topic is the Old Devouring Narwhal, which is probably more complicated than the Arkham Quest in general. The Narwhal is a monster that traversed the stars and when it reached the vat, it ended up in the Primordial Sea and it consumed it to grow. Its growth is probably the reason why the Primordial Water was pushed out into the vat, you know, Newton's third law of motion. One of the multiple problems is that if the people were prophesied to be dissolved, then the prophecy had to be created after the Norwal arrived on Tavat. Especially because when the flood inevitably happened, the people survived, they didn't drown, so the prophecy foresaw their dissolution, not just their genetic death. The other problem comes with what Skirk told us. The Narwhal is her master's pet and he intentionally used the Promorio Sea to raise it. Since the narwhal doesn't belong to Tavat, it shouldn't have appeared in any prediction of the future, just like it happens with the Traveler. So its master has to be from Tavat, so that his actions involving the narwhal would have been predictable by fate. Though there is a chance that, because the narwhal had already become integrated with the Primordial Sea by absorbing its power, it had become part of Tavat as a consequence. So its actions would have become predictable, but this feels like a stretch. Next problem, when did the narwhal arrive? Well, we know that the Primordial Sea was already leaking inside the vat 500 years ago, because Farina had her people monitor these anomalies in the water, so the narwhal has been on the vat for at least 500 years, but I think it has been there for probably way longer, because it needed a way to get inside the macrocosm, and the best time was probably when the vat was almost destroyed, the time Apep told us about, before the nails fixed the world. It then went to sleep and was awakened by chance by a young child falling into the abyss. Whether Skirk's master found the narwhal before a child, that's completely unknown. There is something Skirk said though that is very intriguing. She said that her master decided to use a planet's primordial sea to raise the narwhal, which makes me think that other planets in the universe as well have a primordial sea from which life was born, not just that. The last and biggest question mark here is, who is Skirk's master? Well, it's obviously extremely hard to figure out. His name is Surtaolji the Fowl, he's as powerful and greater than humanity as Vedelfornir the Visionary and Golride Daughter, and he shares a similar goal with the latter. They are both pursuing some kind of perfection. We know that Rhine Daughter is trying to create a primordial human, so her perfection can be found inside that. 
On the other hand, Certology may be looking for its version of perfection somewhere else. I mean, why raise a word very monster otherwise? Surtalogi in Norse mythology is the flaming sword that the giant Surtur, ruler of Muspelsamer, the realm of fire, will use to set the world on fire and destroy it. Now the theory I'm about to share is probably wrong, mainly because Surtalogi may be a completely new character we have never heard before of, not even under a different name, so take it with a grain of salt. I would exclude in a heartbeat Dottore, despite the fact that he is actually trying to create a perfect human. My best bet, if Surtalogi is a character that has already appeared in the game, is Pierro. He is 500 years old, he was a royal mage, he appointed child, the one guy who awakened the narwhal has a harbinger himself, and he is obsessed with the old world. So what he seeks lies outside the vat. I've said in my old videos that I think Piero's goal is to break Thanos' eggshell in which the vat was created and release the world on the old world. Specifically because he promised Signora that her final resting place will be the entirety of the old world. So this word destruction theory would perfectly fit with the Norse Surtalogi. Furthermore, Piero sent people into the abyss to look for something, he knows called Ryan Daughter and he is gathering the Gnosis, something Skirk's master told her about. Talking about the Gnosis, Skirk told Nevelet that they are the remains of the Third Descender. She doesn't really know much about it, nor who this Descender was, but she said that upon death, the ties they had with this world turned to curses. So if she was talking about the Third Descender, they probably died in a bad way. With this new information, we now know that the Gnosis are strictly related to the Descenders, and let's all remember that the Heavenly Principles are the First Descenders. Because the Gnosis are element compatible and can enhance elemental abilities, we finally know why the Traveler can use the elements without the vision. He is basically a walking Gnosis. Now, when did the Third Descender arrive? Well, the first are the Heavenly Principles, so in Primordial Tevat. I still think the second are the heirs from the Battle Pass, so the Envoy Age, since we see a verdant dragon spine, and the fourth arrived before the Cataclysm. It seems that whenever a Descender arrives, a worldwide disaster strikes not long after. The only other real disaster between the Celestial Nails and the Cataclysm is the Archon War, which incidentally is also the first time the Gnosis appeared. Thanks to Nevelet's finally unlocked character stories, we learned that after the War of Vengeance, the Primordial One's functions were ruined, which strangely sounds as if he's talking about the machine. Also, the fact that it is called the War of Vengeance means that the two sides knew each other when they fought, since there can be no vengeance without a shared past, so the Primordial One and the second who came knew each other already. Anyway, the Primordial One couldn't use their absolute authority to suppress the original order of this world, which I guess he is referring to the elements of the old world, so maybe the powers of the dragons, the path to temptation that the Primordial One sealed in before Sun and Moon. Nevelet's story made two things clear. The Primordial One was indeed defeated, which is what I've always thought and also what Apep basically told us already. But they never left that, because they created, together with the Heavenly Principles, the Gnosis to subdue and control the resentments and loathing of the world. Once again, I think he's still referring to the dragons, considering that Apep kept looking for forbidden knowledge to wage war against the Heavenly Principles one more time. A new order was created, the Seven Seeds and Celestia, the humans began receiving visions and all fragments of the Primordial were driven to devour each other, which I believe it refers to the Archon War, so the gods of old were created either by a shade and or from Primordial elements. I would dare to say that the gods of old were more or less inferior versions of Egeria, considering her creation story. Nevelet's story seems to sustain one of my latest theories. The Archons were created to prevent the Dragons from reclaiming their powers and wage a victorious war against the Heavenly Principles. I mean, Nevelet was able to defy Celestia's sentence over the people of Fontaine, so his full Dragonhood is more powerful than Celestia and its fate. 
The last but extremely interesting aspect of Unten's Gnosis is that although it is now basically empty, since the authority has gone back to Nevelet, the Tsaritsa was still interested in acquiring it. This means that maybe what she's after is not the dragon's authorities, but the actual casings, the remains of the third ascender. What will happen when all seven pieces of the descenders are gathered? Not gonna lie, I just heard Dragon Ball's intro in my head for a second there. Anyway, since the noses are pieces of a descender, and if joining them together would bring them back, I guess Celestia is doing nothing against Neshnaya because they can't really predict the future in which a descender is the main protagonist. When it comes to visions, Nevelet's character story says something I've already shared in the past despite it being the opposite of common knowledge. The Seven are involved in the vision granting process. They are the overseers of the material realm and they are duty bound to grant people a shard of their mastery, the visions, even though they don't know who is getting it or why. Since it is defined as a duty, and considering how Nevelet voluntarily decided to put part of his powers at humans' disposal so that their wishes could be rewarded with a vision, like Farina for example, we finally have an explanation to why the people stopped receiving new Electro Visions since the Shogun enacted the Vision Hunt decree. It was an act of insubordination against Celestia. She stopped fulfilling her duty and as a consequence the vision granting process was impeded. It is though somewhat ominous to read that, once a vision holder's duty has been completed, the gods would receive an even greater gift in return. Moving on, our dragon of lore, Novelette, also told us about how this world, fragmented, belonged to the formidable father, which brings me back to an old theory based on Gnosticism. The Foss, the one, the supreme father, what Nevelet would call the formidable father, created the universe and 30 emanation of itself, also known as Eons. The youngest one, the Ian Sophia, went against the rules and created something on her own, the Demiurge, who created the imperfect world and the imperfect humans, which in our case is the Promoter One and its shades who created that. This is also very, very similar to the Aztec's Genesis myth that we're gonna talk about in my last theory of this video. The first god, Ometeotl, created four gods to preside over the four cardinal directions. Quetzalcoatl, god of the light and wind, to the west. Huitzilopochtli, god of war, to the south. Xipetotec, god of gold and farming, to the east. And Tezcatlipoca, god of night, judgment and deceit, to the north. Incidentally, these gods represent the four actual elements Orobashi talked about in the Bathysmal Bishop experimental records. Wind, fire for war, earth for gold, and water for judgment. You know what, even though this may be very stupid, if you think about the four winds, there's Falcon, representing wind, to the west, Wolf to the north, so Andreas, the former god that tests or judges our skills with cryo, and ice is basically still water in a sense, Dragon to the east, and dragons mythologically love gold, and Lion to the south, and lions often symbolize fire and passion. Back to Gnosticism, later the Ian Teletos, Sophia Sisigi, basically her partner, was sent to the imperfect world with two missions. First, he had to give Gnosis to the imperfect humans, that is, a chance to go back to the spiritual world, and into that, the Archons received the Gnosis while the humans received the Visions, which, according to Venti, are inferior versions of the Gnosis, while his second mission was to bring Sophia back to the Pleroma, the totality of 30 eons. At this point, it's very clear that I think that Teletos is the second who came. Obviously, at this point, this theory is very circumstantial, but I'm hoping we will get to visit the floating island of Celestia, since we are literally underneath it now. And maybe there we will get more answers. Something else I talked about in a previous video was how the original or primordial element that Orobashi called Void in the Bathysmal Bishop experimental records may have been mirrored in Tevat by Electro, and curiously, when we fought the shadow inside the narwhal, where everything is steamed after black holes, so you know, the best representation of the Void since not even light can escape it, he actually used Electro attacks. The Dragon of Lore strikes again, this time with a much anticipated ending note specifically about Natlan. To be honest, I was kinda disappointed because Nivellet basically just explained a little better what we already knew. 
In my second analysis video about 4.0, I came to the conclusion that the companions of the heroes that died in Marjivari, as the talking stick tells us, were all some kind of tamed monsters, since they were all named after the cryptids, which are beings not recognized by the scientific community or some dinosaurs that people believe still exist. What Nevelet added was that Natlan is the nation of dragons, although he made a clear distinction between these dragons and the dragon sovereigns like himself. Natlan's dragons have slowly evolved and adapted to the humans and now they simply coexist with them. Then we already knew that Natlan was the nation of war and that the people enjoyed fighting tournaments since the manga, but this was also hinted at in the Agnetus Agate Jemson description as the battle to earn a name. My theory is still the same, there is a huge tournament in which the victor will become the new Pyro Archon and inherit the name Murata. We also already knew that Capitano was going to be in Natlan since Farka's letter in 3.1 and it was kinda obvious that he would have thrown himself in the endless ring of war since he's also a battle maniac. What actually surprised me was that the Archon wasn't even remotely mentioned, not even as the Pyro Archon in general, which simply reinforces my hunch that she is actually dead and her consciousness is still waiting for a worthy successor. My last theory is kinda complicated as it involves a few old theories of mine, some new documents we found in 4.2 and a whole Aztec myth I've never talked about before. I've kept this whole theory to myself for a while, but it is finally time to share it. Ever since Sumeru, some people seem to be obsessed about the concept of Sansara, that Tevat has undergone six full cycles, always ending with Tevat's destruction and people's memories being crystallized into a star of their constellation, hence the six stars in total, and the world starting from zero, meaning that we are now living in the seventh and last Sansara. I never really believed this theory, both because Tevat wouldn't be able to reproduce the arrival of the Descenders, since they are external factors, and because Rukadevata told Nahida that she is her in the new Samsara, so a Samsara is more like an age rather than a cycle of existence of the entire world. So this is basically an update to my original theory that was and is still based on what the 20th century religion called Anthroposophy defined as the seven root races, that is evolutionary stages of humanity recorded in the Akashic records, the compendium of past, present and future events that exist in the mental plane. In 4.2 though, we found a document of the Narcissan Coits Ordo in the Tower of Ipsissimus that talks about how humanity refines itself through Sansara cycles, and that we are now experiencing the fourth one. The last addition to the theory, since Natlan is the next nation, is the Aztec myth of the five suns or worlds. This theory is complicated, but I will try to be as clear as possible. The first root race is called Polarian, and it represents the first age in which the world was still taking shape. According to the Aztecs, the first world was inhabited by giants and the first son was the god Tezcatlipoca, the god of the night, and because of that, he was just half a son. Now, every time a sun falls, the world was destroyed but not completely demolished, until the next god reshaped it while also creating an improved version of the humans. The first word ended when Quetzalcoatl knocked down Tezcatlipoca from the sky with a stone club, and the latter sent his jaguars to eat the humans. I think this, in Genshin Impact, is the primordial Tevat, when the humans lived in the unified nation. Since this age is unknown to the people of Tevat, the Oro couldn't write anything about it. By the way, slightly unexplainable, if this statue holding a bowl represents Egeria, why is the same figure in Ancanomia? And why is this Ever Night White Knight switch almost identical to this device in the core of Fontaine? The second root race is called Hyperborea. According to Anthroposophy, it was a warm era characterized by its golden color, but it took place in the northern regions of the world, the ones that we define as extremely cold. According to the Aztecs, the second son was Quetzalcoatl, who recreated the humans anew, but then they stopped listening to him completely. He didn't really care, he was content with them just living and thriving, but out of nowhere, Tezcatlipoca asserted his dominance and turned the humans into monkeys because of their disobedience. 
Quetzalcoatl, angered, caused a huge hurricane to get rid of the monkeys and step down from being the sun. So the second world ended as well. Since the history of Tevat officially begins here, according to the order, this era is also called Hyperborea. And this is not a new name in the game, since the cold of the northern nation of Tevat is said to originate from Hyperborea. As a consequence, this is what I call the Envoy Age, an era that began with a frozen world that was slowly warming up, but also an era in which the people slowly stopped listening to the gods and rebelled against them. The Ordo also defines the end of this era as the loss of paradise, which makes sense since the people lived happily thanks to the heavens, but because of their rebellion, this era ended with the descent of the Celestial Nails that also wiped out entire civilizations. The third root rate is a bit of a problem. It is called Lemuria, which clearly reminds us of Remuria, but it has nothing to do with it, because according to Anthroposophy, this era ended because of erupting volcanoes that destroyed almost everything. According to the Aztecs, the third sun was the god of the rain, Tlaloc. Everything was perfectly fine and a new version of humans was created. That is until Tezcatlipoca, once again, did something outrageous. He stole Tlaloc's wife away and, because of that, Tlaloc, consumed by grief, caused an endless drought that ended in a rain of fire that burned everything to the ground. And this world ended as well. According to the Ordo, this era was called Natlantean, which makes perfectly sense since in both myths everything revolves around fire. The Ordo also defines the end of this era as the defeat of evil dragons, and yeah, Natlan is the nation of dragons. Chronologically, this was the age of the gods of old, the same age in which Nibelun came back to life only to realize, as Abed said, that the era of the dragons was over. The fourth root race is called Atlantean, created by a sub-race of Lemurian on the continent of Atlantis, which of course is all about water, from the inception to its demise because of a flood. This is also quite problematic to explain, but I'll do my best. According to the Aztecs, the fourth sun was Chalchihuitlique, the goddess of rivers, seas and oceans, but also Tlaloc's new wife. She was a very kind goddess who loved the humans and the earth. But guess what? Tezcatlipoca told her that she didn't really love the humans. She took him seriously and was saddened, so she cried blood for 52 days, causing a massive flood that drowned everyone and everything, ending the world once again. According to the Ordo, this era is called Remuria, and it ended with the original sin and baptism. As a consequence, this fourth root race is specific to Fontaine alone. This era most likely includes both Remuria's rise and fall and, right after, Egeria's sin when she became the Archon, the creation of a new race of humans, so this era probably happened more or less at the same time as the third root race. The fifth fruit race is called Aryan, and it's the current era we are living on Earth. According to the Aztecs, the fifth world is also the current world we are living in. Quetzalcoatl, furious, decided to go to the underworld to steal the bones of the humans and, with his blood, he brought them back to life. So again, a new and improved version of humanity was created. As for the sun, the gods sat around a bonfire and decided that whoever was willing to sacrifice themselves inside of it, they would have become the new sun. Two gods, Nanahuatzin and Texis Tecatl, jumped into the fire, but because there can be two suns, the first one became the sun, while the second one became the moon. In another version, Huitzilopochtli became the sun, but the stars, envy of him, sent the goddess of the moon Koyoshaki, and because of their endless fight, the day and night cycle was created. Either way, the fifth world is ruled by a sun and by a moon. So, in case you never realized it, everything before the current world is everything that happened before sun and moon. According to the Oro, this era is called Hraun Arya, and because the document we found was written not too long after the Cataclysm, they said that they were living in the first half of the era. Now, considering that Hraun is not a real word and that Arya is basically the same name as the root race, 
I believe the Crown Aria means Caria. Because, you know, Crown Aria, Crown Aria, Caria, the name is very similar. Anyway, this era began with the Arkham War and the Institution of the Seven. It reached the halfway mark with Caria and the Cataclysm, so the death of five Archons and a new order of the Seven, so we are currently playing in the second half of the era. The Ordo also defines the end of this era as the freedom from the gods, which makes sense considering how the Archons are going against the heavenly principles. When will this era end? In about 124 days, since Furina became the Archon 499 years to 141 days ago, so 500 years have not yet fully passed. As for the final two root races, they haven't happened yet and don't even have names. The sixth one will be ruled by the reincarnation of Julius Caesar, while the seventh one won't be that different, but according to some, it will end with humanity's migration to Mercury. According to the Aztecs, the world we're living in is supposed to end sooner or later, but no one knows when. They just know that it will. When it comes to the bad, though, we can speculate. The Sixth Era would be an age without the gods, and if the Taritza or Pierrot's goal is to revive the Third Ascender, they will probably be the one person that will rule the entire world. The Seventh Era instead will probably happen when we will go back to Caria of the past thanks to Piero, since in the Travail video, Caria's act is glitched, so it most likely won't happen chronologically after Snezhnaya, but before Mondstadt and before the Cataclysm. And I still think that Piero's goal is to break the eggshell with the forbidden knowledge that Caria used 500 years ago, but also with 500 more years of research on it since the Cataclysm, releasing Tevat on the old world and creating we will call it a new world, which would be similar to the migration to Mercury from Anthroposophy. And that's it, I hope you liked the video. If you did, don't forget to leave a thumbs up, and if you're interested in getting Impact Theory videos, consider subscribing. As a personal opinion on Fontaine, I honestly like the fact that the writers chose to do something completely new. They didn't repeat everything that has happened in the other nations so far. Personally, I'm okay with Furina not being the Archon and not having a playable Archon character because I value the story more than the gameplay, but I can't imagine how many people were disappointed, especially those who collect the Archons and maybe didn't pull for Nevelet, who, for all intents and purposes, is now the Hydra Archon. Let me know in the comments what you think about it. Are you okay with Furina being a normal human with a vision or are you disappointed by this choice? Anyway, I guess it's time to end this very long video and start working on part 2, which is going to be all about the Nazis and Koi's quest. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, over and out.